This is the Enuma Elish, the Babylonian creation epic, and this book is by Timothy J. Stephanie. And I'm going to start just by reading the very first uh, paragraph of the introduction just to see where this comes from to start. The Babylonian creation story, known in ancient times by its opening words, Enuma Elish, meaning, when the heavens above, is a concise presentation of Mesopotamian lore concerning the origins of the gods, the universe, and mankind. Although it is not certain just how far back the fundamental conceptions of this creation were first comprehended, they no doubt far precede this particular version of the Babylonian creation, which was uncovered as tablets from the ancient city of Nineveh dating to the 7th century B.C., Yet these tablets hold within them a composition which may have arisen toward the close of the second millennium B.C., made up of earlier material dating from the Bronze Age. Okay, and it's not written here, but just for reference then, that puts the Enuma Elish anywhere from probably 100 to 300 years approximately before the book of Genesis is attributed to have been written by someone named Moses. Tablet 1 at a time when even the glories above had yet to be named, and unuttered was the word for the world which lay beneath. It was then that the first being Apsu, who was their source, and the progenitor Tiamat, the mother who gave birth to all, intermingled their waters, producing neither field nor marsh. At a time when no divine beings had yet come into existence, there were no names to be spoken, and no fates pronounced but the gods were given birth within those intermixing waves. The first were Lamu and Lahamu. Their names were spoken, but once they had fully grown and become mature of form, then they were born Anshar and Kishar, and they outshone them. And so many days passed by, and many years were counted. Their first son was Anu, being as great as any of his forebears, and Anshar caused his son Anu to become just like himself. From Anu came Nudamud, who was also his spitting image, and Nudamud proved to be even greater than his forebears. Profoundly wise and full of insight, with strength in his limbs, more infused with might than even his grandfather Anshar, with none among the gods who could be considered his equal. That generation of gods would gather together for wild revels, so they proved bothersome to Tiamat. Their hullabaloo echoed. All this commotion proved unsettling to Tiamat's inner being, and she was bothered by all of their activity within Andaruna. There was nothing Apsu could do to mitigate their carousing, but there was nothing Tiamat would say to quiet them down. And no matter how troublesome their conduct became to her, regardless of how rowdy things were, she just put up with it. This kept up until divine Apsu, the source of the mighty gods, summoned to him and spoke to his officer Mumu, saying, Hear me, Mumu, my trusted officer who I can rely upon. Come with me, and together we will go speak with Tiamat. Thus they went together and seated themselves before Tiamat, and they conversed with her about their children, the gods. Apsu raised his voice to be heard, speaking heartily to Tiamat. I have been very troubled by the manner of their conduct, so that I cannot relax during the day nor sleep well at night. Therefore I shall bring it to a halt and get rid of them all. Then silence shall reign, and thus we might get some sleep. But as soon as Tiamat heard his words, she became incensed. Overcome with ire, she screamed intensely at her husband. But then she soothed the furry that raged within her breast. Could we permit our own offspring to be thus eradicated? Despite their troublesome ways, we ought to put up with it. Then the officer Mumu provided his own answer to Apsu. But he spoke at odds with the advice of his mother, the earth. Father, you ought to put an end to their annoying behavior, that one might relax during the day and sleep well at night. Apsu was in full agreement with what he had said, and satisfied with thoughts of devising a vile plan for his sons, the gods, his officer Mumu put his arms around him, 
hugging him, and fell down at his knees and enthusiastically kissed him. Yet what they planned was conveyed to their sons, the gods. For they heard everything and were troubled, pacing about. They all grew quite quiet and sat around without speaking, until the god with the gift for wisdom and understanding, Ea, the god who is insightful, recognized their intentions, and he formulated a solution for it all, planning it out well. He concocted it with superlative skill. His spell was perfect. For when he chanted it, he calmed the turbulent waters, and a bounding sleep overcame Apsu. He became pacified. It caused him to enter a deep sleep, seeped in tranquility, while the officer Mumu, his advisor, was left in a trance. Then Ea removed his belt and took his crown from his head and took his mantle of brilliance and dressed himself in it. Then he forced Apsu down under his feet and crushed him and bound Mumu, lying him down over him crosswise. Then he established his own residence on top of the Apsu, and he then took Mumu, holding him by a nose leash. And after he had subdued and then killed all of his foes, then Ea raised a declaration of victory over his adversaries. Then he could rest easy within his own personal chambers, and these he named Apsu, and established temples there, making it his home. Ea lived in luxury with his wife, Damkina, there within the house of fate, there in the hall of purpose. Then the Lord came, who among all was the most judicious. There within the watery Apsu did Marduk take his shape. Within the unsullied waters of the Apsu was Marduk born. From his father Ea, his mother Damkina gave birth to him. He was suckled on the milk of the goddess's own breasts, and she who breastfed him embodied him with excellence, so that he had a lofty stature. The look of his eyes was intense, mature from the very first and mighty even at a young age. When his grandfather Anu looked upon him, he was glad. His face shone greatly, his heart was exceedingly pleased. So perfect that his head was twice as lofty as any other god, rising high above them, he was better by every measure. Both his arms and legs were well formed beyond comparison, so that it could not be fathomed, almost incomprehensible. Moreover, he possessed four ears to hear and four eyes to see and red flames leapt forth whenever he opened his mouth. His four ears were also considerable of voluminous size, as were his eyes, which were capable of perceiving anything. Being unsurpassed among the gods of exceptional build, having limbs which were mighty and a body terrifically tall. Then Anu cried, Mariutu, my son, you are king of the gods. Dressed in a shining robe fit for ten gods. Rising behind him, there were five almighty beams which surmounted his head, and Anu invented the four winds and then fashioned them. These he set in Marduk's hand, saying, Free them, my son. Then he formed dust and caused the tornado to bear it away. Then he invented the tidal swell, which aggravated Tiamat, and Tiamat was agitated and unsettled both day and night. The gods, meanwhile, were distressed and forced to endure. So with vile thoughts on their minds, they spoke to Tiamat. Because at the time that they killed your husband Apsu, and you failed to stand by his side, but rather sat by silently, thus did Anu invent the four strong winds and tidal swell, so as to intentionally agitate you so that we have no peace. Did you not hold your husband Apsu within your heart? And likewise, the officer Mumu who was also captured? It's not surprising you're forsaken. Are you not a mother? You are unsettled both day and night, but look at our plight. Are we not distressed? Have a heart. Do you not care for us? Look, we lack strength in our limbs, and our eyes are hollow. Free us from this distressing burden that we might get sleep. Raise the war cry. Make them pay for what they have done. Destroy this enemy. Eradicate him entirely from off the earth. 
Tiamat listened to what they said, and she agreed with them. Yes, I think that we ought to do just what you have suggested. The gods who dwell within the Apsu will suffer great misery, for they chose to do evil to those gods that gave them birth, and they gathered about and stood in proximity to Tiamat. They were brutal and planned endlessly both day and night. Grumbling and fuming, all done in the cause of making war, they called together a council of war to consider battle plans. Lady Hubar, who made all, producing an unfailing weapon. She brought big snakes with piercing teeth and vicious fangs. Their bodies she had infused with poison rather than blood, and she caused these raging dragons to emit deadly beams and to wear mantles of brilliance, so that they were like gods. Then the Lady Huber raised her voice, verbalizing the curse. Anyone who gazes at them will be stricken down with horror. They will always raise up their bodies and never back down. Then Tiamat enlisted a horned snake, a Mashusu dragon, a Lamu hero, an Ugala devil, a mad dog and scorpion man brutal umu devils, a half-man, half-fish, a half-man, half-bull, carrying ruthless weaponry and who reveal no fear in battle. Her commands were so portentous that none could be ignored, and in addition to these, she recruited eleven more likewise, and above all of her children, of the gods who had assembled, she conferred upon Kingu, the chief rank amongst them, bestowing the generalship of her army and rule of the Congress, to hold aloft the spear to signify battle, to gather the warriors. She had given him high command of the entire combat force and placed him to be seated upon the throne of rule, saying, I have conjured a spell in your name, making you foremost among the gods of Congress. You now rule all of the gods. You will reign supreme, for further you will be my soulmate. Your orders shall not be disregarded among the Anuki. She conveyed to him the tablet of fate, clasping it at his chest. What you say will not be altered, and you will speak the law. So after King Yu had received his rank, been given Anu power, and had pronounced the fates of his sons, the gods, he said, What comes from out of your lips would obliterate flames. Your potent poison would serve to incapacitate the mighty. Tablet 2 Tiamat then called together the legions of her demon army, assigning divisions to wage war against her sons, the gods. Tiamat caused more harm for future generations than Apsu. It was related to Ea that she was making war preparations, and Ea took heed of that communication upon receiving it. But he was left speechless and sat without uttering a word. After he considered it at length, however... His ire subsided. He went to Anshar, stood before the one who fathered him, and repeated to him everything relating to Tiamat's plans. O oh, father, Tiamat who gave all birth is set on destroying us. She called together a congress and is like a deranged maniac, and the gods have all gone over to her side, every one of them. Even those which you gave rise to have also joined her force. They have gathered around Tiamat and champion her cause. They were brutal and planned endlessly both day and night, grumbling and fuming all done in the cause of making war. They called together a council of war to consider battle plans. Lady Huber, who made all, produced an unfailing weapon. She brought big snakes with piercing teeth and vicious fangs. Their bodies she had infused with poison rather than blood, and she caused these raging dragons to emit deadly beams and to wear mantles of brilliance so that they were like gods. Then the Lady Huber raised her voice, verbalizing the curse. Anyone who gazes at them will be stricken down with horror. They will always raise up their bodies and never back down. Then Tiamat enlisted a horned snake, a Mushusu dragon, a Lamu hero, an Ugulu devil, a mad dog, and scorpion man, 
brutal umu devils, a half-man, half-fish, a half-man, half-bull. Carrying ruthless weaponry and who reveal no fear in battle. Her commands were so portentous that none could be ignored. In addition to these, she recruited eleven more likewise. And above all of her children, of the gods who had assembled, she conferred upon Kingu, the chief rank amongst them. Bestowing the generalship of her army and rule of the Congress to hold aloft the spear to signify battle and gather the warriors. She had given him high command of the entire combat force and placed him to be seated upon the throne of rule, saying, I have conjured a spell in your name, making you foremost among the gods of Congress. You now rule all of the gods. You will reign supreme, for further you will be my soulmate. Your orders shall not be disregarded among the Anuki. She conveyed to him the tablet of fate, clasping it at his chest. What you say will not be altered, and you will speak the law. So after King who had received his rank, been given Anu power, and had pronounced the fate of his sons, the gods, he said, What comes from out of your lips would obliterate flames. Your potent poison would serve to incapacitate the mighty. Anchar heard every word and found the news distressful. How awful! were his first words, afterwards biting his lip, and he was filled inside with anxiety, his muscles tightened. Yet the outburst at his son Ea proved anything but feeble. Son, you began this conflict, so you are responsible for it. For you went forth and killed Apsu, making Tiamat mad. Having done so, need we look any further for her enemy? The Lord of Prudence, Source of wisdom, unsure what to do. Nudimud, with a laying words, replied well to Anshar. O oh, my great father, incomprehensibly do you set destinies, holding in yourself the powers of creation and destruction. O oh, Anshar, incomprehensibly do you determine destinies, holding in yourself the powers of creation and destruction. Please refrain from interrupting while I speak, as I intend to, and keep in mind that my actions were right and justified. And before I killed Apsu, who was there for him to rely upon? Whereas now there has emerged this assortment of demons, and before I could even approach and defeat him, Kingu, he would have already have annihilated me. And what then? Anshar heard every word, and they were agreeable to him. And he was motivated thereby to speak to Ea, saying to him, Yes, son, your deeds were without doubt praiseworthy. You can initiate your own attack, strong and determined. Ea, indeed your deeds were without doubt praiseworthy. You can initiate your own attack, strong and determined. Go out and confront Tiamat. Bring an end to her rebellion. May we pray only that her rage will subside from your spell. And he heard the word spoken by his grandfather Anshar. Then he went upon the roadway, veering neither right nor left. Ea continued on, keeping a lookout for Tiamat's battle lines. But he did not make his voice heard, and instead returned. He went before Anchar the king and humbly beseeched him. Father, the ways of Tiamat are far too potent for me to handle. I went in search of her route, but my spell was inferior to hers. She holds powers that are alarming, and she is utterly horrific. The forces about her are supreme. None could stand against her. Her great din never subsides, being too much for me to take. Her voice struck me with terror, so much that I headed back. Yet do not refrain, father. Rather, dispatch another against her. No matter how strong a woman, she still cannot equal a man, thereby dispersing her legions and confounding her orders. This you must do before she overwhelms us with her powers. Anshar spoke anxiously, addressing himself to his son Anu. My dependable son, who is as valiant as the Kasusu weapon, 
who possesses formidable powers and an unbearable charge. Proceed to face Tiamat and never fail to hold your position. Cause her fury to withdraw and reduce her rage into stillness. But if she fails to listen, then beseech her so as to appease her. And he heard every word that was spoken by his father Anshar. Then he went upon the roadway, veering neither right nor left. Anu continued on, keeping a lookout for Tiamat's battle lines. But he did not make his voice heard, and instead returned. He went before Anshar the king and humbly beseeched him. Father, the ways of Tiamat are far too potent for me to handle. I went in search of her route, but my spell was inferior to hers. She holds powers that are alarming, and she is utterly horrific. The forces about her are supreme. None could stand against her. Her great din never subsides, being too much for me to take. Her voice struck me with terror, so much so that I headed back. Yet do not refrain, father, rather dispatch another against her. No matter how strong a woman, she still cannot equal a man thereby dispersing her legions and confounding her orders. This you must do before she overwhelms us with her powers. Anchar could not find words, but cast his eyes onto the floor. He ground his teeth and could give no encouragement to Ea, so that all the Iljiji gathered together and all of the Anuki. For a time they sat without speaking, lips closed, then spoke. Will not any god step forward? Or is our fate predetermined? Will not anyone go to confront Tiamat with a force of arms? Then from his secluded abode, Ea sent forth a declaration. To the faultless one of Anshar, father of the mighty gods, him with a true heart, like a fellow citizen or countryman, that formidable heir who was destined to defend his father who strikes fearlessly into the fray, Marduk, the champion. And he related to him the plans he had formulated, saying, Marduk, heed my counsel. Give ear to your father's words. The son of his who brings him confidence? Go before Anshar, move in near to him, and make resolute declarations to him. All of his anxieties will take flight, once you are before him. And Lord Marduk was well pleased with his father's words. Thus he went and approached to stand in front of Anshar. And Anshar gazed upon him, and his heart filled with glee. Then he kissed him upon the lips and put aside his fears. And Marduk raised his voice to be heard, saying to Anshar, Father, you must not remain silent, but rather speak to me. And permit me to go. Let me do that which you wish me to do. Anshar, you must not remain silent, but rather speak to me. And permit me to go. Let me do that which you wish me to do. And Anshar raised his voice to be heard, saying to Marduk, What sort of man would be willing to send you off to this war? Son, this is Tiamat, a female, and she it is who will attack you. And Marduk raised his voice to be heard, saying to Anshar, O oh, father, you brought me to life. Be glad and of good cheer, for soon your foot will be resting upon the very neck of Tiamat. O oh, Anshar, who brought me to life, be glad and of good cheer, for soon your foot will be resting upon the very neck of Tiamat. Then Anshar raised his voice to be heard, speaking to Marduk. Go then, son, with my blessing, with all your superior wisdom, and cut Tiamat down to size with your perfect incantations. Go on your way at once, within the chariot of the storm clouds, so that her men cannot advance, but rather make them retreat. And he was gladdened and spoke to his grandfather, saying, Ruler of the gods, deviser of the destinies of the high gods, if I am to be your defender and defeat Tiamat to preserve you, then assemble a commission and proclaim a singular destiny. 
and rest content, among the others, within the hall of the Divine Congress. For my own words rather than yours will determine destiny. Whatever I accomplish will not be undone, never overturned. And the verdict that issues from my lips will never be rescinded. End of Tablet 2 Tablet 3 Then Anshar raised his voice to be heard, to his officer Kaka. Hear me, Kaka, my trusted officer who I can depend upon. I am sending you on a journey to go to Lamu and Lahamu. For you are good at ascertaining, a superlative communicator, so that the gods who are my fathers will gather here to me, so that all of the gods will be assembled here in my presence, that we might then have a discussion. Gather them for a feast, and give them plenty of bread to eat, and the best of wine. Then after, have them declare a destiny for Marduk, the hero. So you must go soon, Kaka, and place yourself before them, and convey to them everything that I will now relate to you. Your son Anshar is the one who sent me to speak to you, and he asked me to convey his own inner thoughts, saying, Behold, Tiamat, who gave all birth, is determined to destroy us. She called together a congress and is like a deranged maniac, and the gods have all gone over to her side, every one of them. Even those which you gave rise to have also joined her force. They have gathered around Tiamat and champion her cause. They were brutal and planned endlessly both day and night, grumbling and fuming, all done in the cause of making war. They called together a council of war to consider battle plans. Lady Huber, who made all, produced an unfailing weapon. She brought big snakes with piercing teeth and vicious fangs. Their bodies she had infused with poison rather than blood, and she caused these raging dragons to emit deadly beams and to wear mantles of brilliance so that they were like gods. Then the Lady Huber raised her voice, verbalizing the curse. Anyone who gazes at them will be stricken down with horror. They will always raise up their bodies and never back down. Then Tiamat enlisted a horned snake, a Mashusu dragon, a Lamu hero, an Ugulu devil, a mad dog, and scorpion man. Brutal Umu devils, a half-man, half-fish, a half-man, half-bull. Carrying ruthless weaponry and who reveal no fear in battle. Her commands were so portentous that none could be ignored, and in addition to these, she recruited eleven more likewise, and above all of her children, of the gods who had assembled, she conferred upon Kingu the chief rank amongst them all, bestowing the generalship of her army and rule of the Congress, to hold aloft the spear to signify battle and gather the warriors. She had given him high command of the entire combat force and placed him to be seated upon the throne of rule, saying, I have conjured a spell in your name, making you foremost among the gods of Congress. You now rule all of the gods. You will reign supreme, for further you will be my soulmate. Your orders shall not be disregarded among the Anuki. She conveyed to him the tablet of fate, clasping it at his chest. What you say will not be altered, and you will speak the law. So after Kingu had received his rank, been given Anu power, and had pronounced the fates of his sons, the gods, he said, What comes from out of your lips would obliterate flames. Your potent poison would serve to incapacitate the mighty. So I sent forth Anu, but he was not able to stand up to her while Nudamud was panic-stricken and merrily came back. Until Marduk, your son, most capable of the gods, emerged, and he wished of his own accord to stand against Tiamat, he raised his voice to be heard and spoke these words to me. If I am to be your defender and defeat Tiamat to preserve you, then assemble a commission and proclaim a singular destiny. Then rest content among the others within the council chambers, for my own words rather than yours will determine destiny. Whatever I accomplish will not be undone, never overturned, 
and the verdict that issues from my lips never be rescinded. So act in haste and declare a destiny for him with all speed that he might go and confront your overwhelming foe. Thus Kaka went forth to carry out the mission given to him, and in front of the gods Lamu and Lahamu, his forebears, he knelt down kissing the ground which lay before them, then raised himself fully to stand and related these words. Your son Anshar is the one who sent me to speak to you. And he asked me to convey his own inner thoughts, saying, Behold, Tiamat, who gave all birth, is determined to destroy us. She called together a congress and is like a deranged maniac, and the gods have all gone over to her side, every one of them. Even those which you gave rise to have also joined her force. They have gathered around Tiamat and championed her cause. They were brutal and planned endlessly both day and night, grumbling and fuming, all done in the cause of making war. They called together a council of war to consider battle plans. Lady Huber, who made all, produced an unfailing weapon. She brought big snakes with piercing teeth and vicious fangs, their bodies she had infused with poison rather than blood, and she caused these raging dragons to emit deadly beams and to wear mantles of brilliance so that they were like gods. Then the Lady Huber raised her voice, verbalizing the curse. Anyone who gazes at them will be stricken down with horror. They will always raise up their bodies and never back down. Then Tiamat enlisted a horned snake, a Mashushu dragon, a Lamu hero, an Ogulu devil, a mad dog, and scorpion man. Brutal Umu devils, a half-man, half-fish, and half-man, half-bull, carrying ruthless weaponry and who reveal no fear in battle. Her commands were so portentous that none could be ignored, and in addition to these, she recruited eleven more likewise. And above all of her children, of the gods who had assembled, she conferred upon Kingu the chief rank amongst them all, bestowing the generalship of her army and rule of the Congress, to hold aloft the spear to signify battle and gather the warriors. She had given him command of the entire combat force and placed him to be seated upon the throne of rule, saying, I have conjured a spell in your name, making you foremost among the gods of Congress. You now rule all of the gods. You will reign supreme, for further you will be my soulmate. Your orders shall not be disregarded among the Anuki. She conveyed to him the tablet of faith, clasping it at his chest. What you say will not be altered, and you will speak the law. So after Kingu had received his rank, been given Anu power, and had pronounced the fates of his sons, the gods, he said, What comes out of your lips would obliterate flames. Your potent poison would serve to incapacitate the mighty. So I sent forth to Anu, but he was not able to stand up to her, while Nudamud was panic-stricken and merrily came back until Marduk, your son, most capable of the gods, emerged, and he wished of his own accord to stand against Tiamat. He raised his voice to be heard and spoke these words to me. If I am to be your defender and defeat Tiamat to preserve you, then assemble a commission and proclaim a singular destiny. Then rest content among the others within the council chambers, for my own words rather than yours will determine destiny." Whatever I accomplish will not be undone, never overturned, and the verdict that issues from my lips never be rescinded. So act in haste and declare a destiny for him with all speed, that he might go and confront your overwhelming foe. And Lamu and Lahamu heard every word and cried out, and every one of the Ijiji were overcome with sad moaning. But this is awful. For before Anshar sent us this intelligence, we had not the least idea of what Tiamat was planning to do. They made their way and gathered, the high gods who fix fate. And they came into Anshar's company, being at once cheerful, greeting one another with kisses, and there in the meeting hall they discussed among themselves, sitting together for a feast. And they ate plenty of bread and imbibed the best of the wine, so that they slurped up flavorful beer through drinking straws and were made full through consumption of the alcohol. 
As a result of this, they became cheerful, their hearts rejoiced, and they pronounced the destiny for Marduk, their hero. End of Tablet 3 Tablet 4 Then for his use, they constructed for him a royal palace, and he occupied it as ruler of his forebears who declared, You, who are most revered among all of the high gods, your life is magnificent. Your speech has the force of Anu. Marduk, you are the most revered of any of the high gods. Your life is magnificent. Your speech has the force of Anu. From henceforth, your commands will never be distorted. You hold the power to both raise up and to compel down. Let your proclamations be law and let your words be true. And not a single god will supersede the boundaries you set. Let there be an account created in support of your estate, like those required for the gods' temples where they stand. You, Marduk, are our defender. You, Lord, are our defender. You must bestow upon you rule over the entire cosmic order. When seated in the council, your words are second to none. Let it be that your weapons never stray from their targets, but rather let it be that your weapons crush your enemies. Lord, be merciful toward the one who puts his faith in you, but also diminish the life of any god who is a worker of evil. Then they placed amongst themselves a single constellation and raised their voices to be heard to Marduk, their son. Lord, may your proclamations be miraculous to the gods. Speak orders for both destruction and for renewal. Amen. So proclaim to it that the constellation may then disappear. Proclaim to it yet again that the constellation may be seen again. Upon speaking at his utterance, the constellation disappeared. And upon speaking again at his utterance, the constellation reappeared. When his forebears, the gods, observe the power of his words, then they cry out in jubilation, declaring, Marduk is king. Then bestowed unto him the scepter, throne, and staff of rule, and unto his hand an unbeatable weapon to destroy his enemy. Then they cheered, March forth and sever the life of Tiamat. May the winds carry her blood here to declare good tidings. Then his forebears, the gods, pronounced the fate of the Lord, encouraging him to embody ideals of measure and restraint. Marduk created a bow, and this he fashioned to be his weapon, then fletched the arrow with feathers and set it onto the string. Rising aloft a mace that he held with his rigid right hand, slinging the bow over his arm, setting the quiver at his side. With lightning before him, eternal flame burning within him, he also fashioned a net which he could use to encircle Tiamat. He mastered the four winds so that she might have no escape. South wind, north wind, east wind, and west wind, he took gifts from his father Anu that were kept at hand with the net. He generated the terror gust, the tempest, the whirlwind. Four gales and seven winds, the tornado and the hurricane. Setting forth the seven he had made, they followed behind. The Lord raised his mighty mace called the flood weapon before mounting his awesome, fear-rearing storm chariot. Harnessed to it was a quartet that had been strapped to it, one called Killer, another Merciless, also fleet and high flyer. And their jaws were lowered, their teeth filled with venom. They knew nothing of giving up. They knew only of attack. To the right of him, he positioned both Blitzkrieg and Clasher, and on the left, he put another name, Total Extermination. Then dressed in a drapery of the most formidable armoring, upon his head was a halo blazing forth with a blinding glow. So the Lord thus set forth and traveled upon the roadway, heading in the direction of Tiamat, who rampaged wildly. Upon his tongue he held a spell, an incantation on his lips, holding within his hand a herb for protection against toxins. They all gathered about him, the gods amassed around him. His forebears gathered about him, they amassed around him, 
Then the Lord came near, setting his sights on Tiamat's heart, and attempted to divine the stratagem of Kingu, her partner. But as Kingu gazed out at him, his mind became bewildered, and his fortitude fell to pieces. His actions became awkward. As for his allies, the gods, those who had gone along with him, when looking at his chief, the contender, they grew anxious. But Tiamat worked her magic with no need to avert her gaze. Within her mouth there resides lies, deception, and cunning. Just how strong is this army you have with you, Lord of Gods? The whole collection of them holds near to your own location. But the Lord held up his fearsome weapon, the flood weapon, conveying his words to Tiamat, who feigned kindness, saying, For what reason do you display this superficial benevolence, when in your heart of hearts you generated a force for war? Only because your sons, the gods, were making such a noise, only because they have been inconsiderate of their forebears. But why ought you, who gave them birth, not forgive them? You chose King U to be your partner and also your war leader, bestowing unto him the Anu power which he does not deserve, and acted in enmity towards Anchar, honored king of gods. Thus you have multiplied the evils gone against my forebears. So make your army ready, equipped with what arms you have, or step forward yourself that we might engage one on one. As soon as Tiamat had heard this speech that he had given, she went ballistic and flew into a wild and unstoppable rage. With no little emotion, Tiamat bawled at the top of her lungs, and her viscera trembled altogether to her very foundation. Undeterred in discharging her magic, she then spoke spells. At the same time, the warriors were busy honing their blades. Tiamat and Marduk, defender of the gods, faced one another moving towards each other, preparing for the coming clash. The Lord unleashed his net and cast it out to entrap Tiamat. He called from behind him the terror gust to fly in her face. Tiamat figured to open her mouth so as to swallow the wind, but the great force of the terror gust kept her mouth open. The raging winds bloated her belly. She spread her jaws wide. Marduk released an arrow which struck her distended middle. Then he cleaved her into two pieces and cut open her heart, having defeated her, thus bringing her hateful life to an end. Tossing her down onto the dirt and setting his feet upon her, and after this, when he had killed their war leader Tiamat, he caused their legions to disperse. Her army was in disarray, and the gods who were allies, who had stood beside her, all of them shook in fear, were struck with terror, and fled. Yet he allowed them to give themselves up, sparing them, since they were at once encircled and not allowed to escape. So he had them bound and destroyed all of their weaponry, and they were trapped within a net, and there they remained. Then they shrank back, overcome as they were by despair. But they endured this affliction of being held incarcerated, and concerning the several demons emitting deadly beams, these being the army of creatures who passed to her right. He attached onto them nose leashes and bound their limbs. Then he crushed underfoot their foul instruments of warfare. Regarding King U, who was the highest ranked among them, he ruined him, adding him to the tally of the other defeated, seizing from him the tablet of fate, which he did not deserve, and impressed upon it his own seal, clasping it at his chest. Then after he had overcome and destroyed his adversaries, Announcing that the defeated enemy were now his slaves, he provoked a song of victory of Anshar over all of his foes, realizing the plans which were formulated by Nudamud. The warrior Marduk now dominated the incarcerated gods. To Tiamat he now turned his attention, the one he had caught, and the lord Marduk trod upon the lower parts of her body. Raising his merciless hammer high, he pulverized her skull, then sliced open the arteries that carried her watery blood. He caused the north wind to take it, to convey good tidings. When his forebears saw it, they were jubilant and all sang out, then made plans to meet him with presents and gifts of greeting. The Lord took a moment to rest and looked over her corpse. 
he split the monster's cadaver and made marvelous things, severing it up the middle, flaying it half like a drying fish, one of which he thrust up to make the vault of the heavens. He drew a gate in front of it, put into the care of a guardian. Her waters were bounded so that they might not surge free, and he went forth traversing the sky, seeking a holy place. He made the Apso, Nudamud's dwelling, entirely smooth. And the Lord then measured out the Apsu's total dimensions. The immense shrine which he built to resemble it was Eshera, and the temple Eshera, which he made to resemble heaven. There he placed the centers of veneration for Anu, Elil, and Ea. End of Tablet 4 Tablet 5 He constructed various stations for every one of the high gods, and concerning the stars he placed constellations for each one. Then he established the year and set forth its subdivisions. He assigned three stars to signify each of the twelve months, and as he formulated his intentions for every day of the year, he set forth the station of Nibiru to delineate their movement, that not one of them would veer from its appointed course. In addition, he established the stations made for Elil and Ea, and made passages which passed through the two rib racks, likewise forming a hatch both to the left and to the right while her liver was placed so as to locate the highest point. He brought into existence the crescent moon to rule night, and he assigned this night gem to be an indicator of days. Never fail from proceeding each month in a circle of light. Upon the first of the month, spread your light to all lands. You arise bright with your horns as an indicator of six days, and upon the seventh day your crown is half in darkness." The fifteenth day will be halfway at every month's midpoint, a time when Shamash faces you from the opposite horizon, then slowly begin to diminish in appearance as you wane. Make the day you are invisible near the track of Shamash. On the thirtieth day, perform calibrations for the year, because Shamash ultimately determines the year's length. Whenever there is an indicator, proceed over its own course. Then, do not fail to enter the Hall of Judgment and decide. Make your selection of the bow star for robbery and war. Make your choice Ninma for pregnancy and the unborn. Make your choice the harrow for the fertility of the field. Make your choice wild boar for growth and productivity. Make your choice the mad dog for cleansing and purification. Make your choice the scorpion for the overthrow of kingdoms. Make your choice Pablasag to bring death and destruction. Make your choice the goatfish for disease, plague, and famine. Let your choice be Gula as a source of wealth and prosperity. Make your choice Lulu and Latterak for defense and security. Make your choice the bull of heaven for ruin and desolation. Make your choice the true shepherd for revolt and occupation. Include likewise the star cluster for conquest and domination. The star cluster will rise at the time of the New Year's festival. Year after year it will be the most festive day among the people. Then may all restrictions be lifted and all ways be made clear. The latch of the way out will be loosened to give free ingress beginning with these days until the coming close of seasons. Both the watches and day and night will be properly assigned. Now will the dribble of Tiamat be the next thing to be utilized. Marduk collected together all of the dribble that had spilled. He collected it into clusters and made the scurrying clouds, giving rise to the winds and making it a source for the rains. By gathering together her venom, he caused mists to swell. These he managed himself to be controlled by his own hand. He set her head out and heaped up deep mounds of terrain, severing open bursting springs from which streams poured. He made the Tigris and Euphrates rivers pour from her eyes, sealed up her nostrils so that the baleful river would not flow. He gathered together from her utter 
the treeless mountains and drilled out holes so as to drain away the stagnant waters. Spanning her tail across, fixing it fast to tie up to the heavens, and established the waters of the Apsu underneath his feet. Then he placed her thigh so as to bolster up the sky's vault. Half of her body was used to make up the sky, half the earth. He twirled the creation so that the insides of Tiamat spun. He spread out his net so that it spanned the entire world, then fixed its endpoints to places upon heaven and earth binding them with knots after looping them around pillars. Then after he set forth religion, designating its rituals, he then tossed down the reins, which were taken up by Ea. He then took up the tablet of fate that Kingu had taken, and he delivered it to Ea to be used in the initial reading. Then the prisoners of war he'd shackled were rank-ordered, and he marched them in enslavement before his forebears. As for the eleven demons Tiamat had spawned, he took them, destroyed their arms, and had them bound beneath his feet. Then he had pictures made of them and fixed at Apsu's gate. Let these be an indication that are recalled in future years. The gods all gazed, and their hearts were glad because of him. Then Lamu and Lahamu and his forebears clasped him fondly, and King Anshar declared, they hold a celebration in his name. Then each of the gods, Anu, Elil, and Ea, gave him many gifts. And his mother Damkina likewise spoke joyous words to him, and caused him to become bright within his splendid place. He assigned Usma, who conveyed his gifts as good tidings, to serve as officer of the Apsu and to manage the temples. Then the Ejiji gathered, and each of them bowed before him. Then every single one of the Anunnaki fell to kiss his feet. And thus the entire throng came to pay obeisance to him. Standing before him, they inclined, saying, Truly, the king. The gods, his forebears, supped the full measure of the man. Removing his ordinary clothes, besmirched with battle filth, and his gods, his forebears, took due care of his every need showering his body with water imbued with cypress wood, donning a regal raiment and aspect and a fabulous crown. He then picked up the mace and held it in his right hand. He then picked up the scepter and held it in his left hand, and was led by Elil to be seated upon the imperial throne, who had a footrest placed there to accommodate his feet. Anu set upon his lap the bow which had pierced Tiamat and placed a rod of peace at his side, and one of obligation. When the mantles of brilliance were brought before him, while his net was being used to hold fast dreadful Apsu, a bull was led by Ea and slaughtered for the banquet. There within the innermost chamber of his throne room and within his cellar were placed stocks of wine and liquors. The gods and every living thing in existence revered him. Lamu and Lahamu paid their undivided homage to him. They raised their voices to be heard, speaking to the Ijiji. Until now, Marduk has only been our own cherished son. Yet now, he also stands as your monarch. Obey him truly. Then they raised their voices to be heard, speaking together. Lugal Demer Ankia is his name. Put reliance in him. And when Marduk was the recipient of their stately honors, they declared splendid words of praise and service to him. From this time forward, you will construct our holy temples, and everything you request of us, we will always act to fulfill. So Marduk raised his voice to be heard, intending to speak. The king raised his voice to speak to his forebears, the gods, above the sea green dwelling the Apsu, near to Ashara, which I made for you after firming the earth for a temple. There will I build my own personal abode to solidify my rule. At the times that you arise from the Apsu to have a congress, accommodating all of you, you will spend your nights there. At the times that you descend from heavens to have a congress, accommodating all of you, you will spend your nights there. 
from now on, it will be called Babylon, the high God's place, and we will call it to be the locus of all religious practices. And his forebears, the gods, heard every word of his decree. None but you, sire, could have devised such a worthy thing. Who could exceed your ability beyond what you have done? Who could exceed your works beyond the lands you made? The name you have just now enunciated, which is Babylon, we will have found there our night's lodgings forevermore. As for the people, they must bring to us their usual offerings, so that man will be the one who must labor daily in the field. And for every kind of exertion that we do for his own benefit, there will the product of his own labors be laid before us. And all shouted gleefully for the product of his great work. The gods will be their lords and have supremacy over them. Who among them knows by what power they give him light? He raised his voice to be heard, making his orders known. His sovereignty was to be established over them henceforth. He was established upon the throne of everlasting honors. And they bowed to him in praise. Then the gods said to him, speaking their words to their lord, Lugal Dimmer Ankia. Until now, Mordok has only been our own cherished son. Yet now he also stands as your monarch. Obey him truly. The god Anu bestowed unto him long life and abundance. The god Elil gave mantles of brilliance, mace, and scepter. The god Ea made known to him all the wisdom of the ages. While we dedicate ourselves to defending his rule forever. End of Tablet 5 Tablet 6 Once Marduk heard the words that the gods had declared, he was then determined to accomplish unparalleled deeds, directing his words to Ea of the plan he was mulling over. My thought is to collect blood and construct bones also. My thought is to create a primitive human to be called man. So thus I am well inclined to give rise to primal humanity, and the work which is now done by the gods he will do so that the gods will not be required to labor forevermore. Through this, I will alter dramatically life among the gods, so that they might be viewed as one, even if in two camps. Ea replied to him and said these words to him, to Marduk, relating to him what he thought would bring the gods rest. Then have one who has been rebellious be brought forward, that he might be slain, so that people might thus be made and then bring together a council of all the high gods. Have the offender handed over and convicted of his offense. So thus Marduk brought together a council of high gods and related to them without trouble the details of the plan, passing on his commands, and the gods listened attentively, and they heard everything which he communicated to them. Thus the king directed his words to the Anunnaki, saying, The decision you have made to crown me king shall endure. May it not be superseded, and I will forever speak the law, and declare every statute on matters I have dominion over. Who is the one who is responsible for provoking this war and encouraging Tiamat to gather together a battle force? Have this one who gave rise to the war brought before me, so that he might be judged and sentenced for his offense so that you, the gods, will no longer be troubled by him. Then the Ejiji, the high gods, provided their answer to him. The Lord Lugal Dimmer Ankia, judge of the gods, saying, The one you seek is Kingu. It is he who provoked this war. It was he who encouraged Tiamat to gather a battle force. And thus they chained him and brought him before Ea. And they judged and sentenced him and spilled his blood. From this, Ea made humankind, from out of his lost blood. To him they gave the labor of the gods, thus freeing them. Then, after the knowledgeable Ea had made humankind, he had him do the labor of the gods, a deed beyond words. For Nudama did it with the wondrous power of Marduk. King Marduk then caused the gods to be separated into two, 
each of the Anunnaki was to be assigned above or beneath, and he spoke a pronouncement that Anu be the guardian, and designated three hundred gods to guard the heavens. Then did just the same in his declaration concerning earth, so that the entire six hundred resided on earth or in heaven. Then after he had finished making all of his declarations, having made the Anunnaki reside in either heaven or earth, the Anunnaki raised their voices to Lord Marduk, saying, Since you have now liberated us from our work, O Lord, what manner of kindness might you now bestow unto us? For we would like to construct a temple of great distinction, to have our sleeping quarters alongside yours, so as to rest. Thus, permit us to build a temple where we might find shelter, so that whenever we gather to you, we might lounge there. Once Marduk heard their words, his face shone like sunlight. Then build Babylon to be the construction project you seek. Have there be mud bricks cast and construct a lofty temple. Thus the Anunnaki excavated, making bricks for a full year. And when the following year came, they had erected it high, rising aloft the peak of Esagila, which was nearby the Apsu. Thus they had constructed a lofty ziggurat fit for the Apsu. There were also built places of residence for Anu, Elil, and Ea. Highest among any edifice, it was established before them, where its towers gazed down upon the foundations of Ashara. After they had completed their work on the temple Esagia, and each of the Anunnaki made his own personal temple, then the three hundred Ejiji gods who inhabited heaven, together with the Anunnaki gods of the Apsu, came together. Then the Lord invited his forebears, the gods, to a feast. There in the vast palace he had made as his own residence. Truly, this gate of God will now likewise be your home. And so let there be singing and festivity and be content. Thus the high gods took their places there at the tables. Beer mugs were set out, and they took part in the banquet. And after having enjoyed themselves there for some time, they all went to Grand Esagia to make a show offering. Thus, every one of these orders and aims were established, and each god had been given a place in heaven or on earth. And fifty high gods set forth the seven echelons of the cult, and the Lord took his bow up and placed it before them. His forebears, the gods, also examined the net he had made, inspecting the bow, gazing upon its wondrous workmanship and his forebears extolled all of his fine accomplishments. Then Anu lifted her up and addressed the divine council, kissing the bow and saying, Let her have unrivaled range, and declared for the bow what she would be called, saying, Thus ought long and far be primary, victory, secondary. And her third name is Bow Star, for its glow in the heavens, and he secured her a place amongst her associates, the gods. Then after Anu had declared the rank of the bow henceforth, he located her throne. Of all gods your place will be the highest. Anu caused her to be seated at the divine council of the gods. The high gods congregated and made Marduk foremost of all. Bowing themselves before him, they swore oaths of allegiance. And it was sworn by water and oil, motioning to their necks. In doing so, they thus affirmed that he be the God's overlord, and certified his rule over every God in both heaven and earth. Then Anshar declared that Marduk be known as Asarluhi. Then, when his name is pronounced, we will all bow ourselves. And the gods are well advised to give due notice to his words. His declaration shall have precedence both above and beneath and there will be none higher than the Son who is our Avenger. With his authority second to none, he shall have no challenger. He will be a shepherd to the entire people of his own making. May all his acts be spoken of in the future, never to be forsaken. He will begin the grand food offering in honor of his forebears. He will be their guardian and will be the protector of their temples. He will cause them to breathe deeply of the smoke offering. As such, he will cause their utterances to be joyous and mirthful. May his breath be as freely taken on earth as it is in heaven. 
May he cause the entire people of earth to give him reverence, so that humankind will remember him and call him their God. May their mediating goddess give heed whenever he speaks. May these food offerings be made to both God and goddess, so that they never be forsaken, so that they abide by their God. So their nation is supreme, never ceasing from erecting temples. Even as the entire people each chooses his own among the gods, for us, under whatever name he might be called, he is our God. So gather round and let us call him by all his fifty names. May all his manners be recalled in the future. All he does also, Marduk as Anu, his father, chose at the time he was born, to guard pastures, lakes, and springs so that the herds increase who overpowered the rebels with his awesome flood weapon and released his forebears, the gods, from their anguishes. May his name be declared to be the Sun, King of the Gods. Might they walk henceforth in the glow of his pervading aura. The humans that he made of mortal life who must breathe, he set them to do the gods' work that they might have leisure. Both creation and obliteration, both sentence and absolution. These he might always call upon, so they ought to defer to him. Maruka is the name of the god that made humankind, bringing blessings to the Anunnaki, freeing the Ijiji from toil. Maratuka is benefactor of the land, town, and people. He is the one that humankind will give reverence for all time. Mershakushu is severe but kind, forceful but forgiving. He is magnanimous of heart, and is not ruled by his emotions. Lugal Dimmer Ankia, the name we gave him together. His decrees we made superior to those of his forebears, the gods. There is no doubt he is Bel of every god of heaven and earth, a king whose words are revered by the gods above and beneath. Neri Lugal Dimmer Ankia is his name as leader of gods who gave us homes in heaven and earth despite the challenges, and who assigned the various duties of the Ajiji and Anunnaki. At the utterance of his names, the gods rightly shudder at home. Asarluhi is the name given to him by his grandfather Anu. May he provide guidance to the gods and be the best chief, who, true to his name, is guardian of both divinity and nation, saving our homes from the tide of war despite the challenges. Also, they refer to Asarluhi as Nantila, given he is God of life. He healed each of the injured gods as though he'd made them. He is Bel, who brings the dead gods back with his perfect spell, defeating all his challengers and conquering all his enemies. The third name of Asarluhi is Namru, given for this reason. He is the God of purity who cleanses the pathways before us. Anshar, Lamhu, Lahamhu shouted out his three names. They declared them openly before all their children, the gods. We have designated him to be known by these three names. So then you too must shout these names out just as we have. And the gods were pleased and did as they were commanded. In the council chambers there was a discussion in their assembly. We ought to do something to honor the sun, the hero's name. Him who is our defender and is our guardian and savior. They took seats at the council and started to proclaim fates, and they voiced his name during every one of their rituals. End of Tablet 6 Tablet 7 Asar, giver of farmland, and he who defines its limits, inventor of cereals and flaxseed, who brings plant growth. Asar Alim, whose sage words of advice are well regarded within the Hall of the Congress, esteemed above all others. Among the gods, even the fearless ones give heed to him. Asar Alim Nuna, who is much honored and praised, who is the shining light of his forebears, his progenitors, who manages the decrees of Anu, Elil, Ea, and Damkina. Yes, it is he who sustains them and gives them livelihood. His own farm provides enough to bring surplus to the land. He is known as Tutu, 
having brought their restoration, and he will cleanse their temples that they need not work. And he will create a spell so that the gods will live in peace. If any of them should become enraged, he will quell them. He will be utmost at the congress of his forebears, the gods, and there will emerge no god who could surmount him. He, as Tutu, is also Zi-Ukina, who enlightens his people, who set firmly into place the flawless heaven for the gods, who determined their manner and established their order. Let him not ever be forsaken by the multitude of humanity, so that they may always recall all of his accomplishments. Tutu is thirdly known as Ziku, who insists upon cleanliness. God of sweet scents, the Lord of adherence and agreement, giver of wealth and plenty, who produces beyond his needs. He who can transform short supply into great abundance. When beset by the worst calamity, we smell his sweetness. Let them speak utterances of praise and glorify him in song. Fourth, may humankind worship Tutu by the name Agaku. He being Lord of the Immaculate Spell, bringing resurrection. He is compassionate even to the gods who are captives of war. He relieved the burden placed upon the gods, even his rivals. He who made humankind to release them from their labors, being filled with blessings, and one who can bring even life. He will speak words as durable as stone that will not be lost, when the body of people speak who he made with his hands. Fifth, they will refer to Tutu as Tuku, of flawless incantations, eradicating all the malevolent through his immaculate spell. Call him Shazu, fully aware of the gods' plans and feelings. He will not permit the workers of evil to flee from his clutches, founder of the divine council who fulfills what pleases them, bringing the Hati to their knees under his broad shelter, overseer of justice and who recognizes deception in speech, and from where he plainly differentiates a lie from the truth. Let them also praise Shazu Azizi, who stifles the aggressive, who banishes doom from the bodies of his forebears, the gods. Third, Shazu is Surim, who eradicates all enemies in war, bringing an end to their plans, banishing them far and wide, bringing an end to all who are evil, no matter where they are, that the gathered gods may forever remember his victories. Fourth, he is Shazu, should too be known as Sigurim, having charge of the compliance of his forebears, the gods, who eradicates the enemy and obliterates their descendants who ended their designs so that nothing remained of them. May his name be praised and declared throughout the land. Fifth, let the descendants of man know Shazu as Zahirim, who brings every enemy given to haughtiness to an end, and all gods who have been driven out to their temples. So may it be instituted that he might be known by his name. Sixth, have them all likewise worship Shazu as Sigurim, who brought an end to every enemy by his fortitude in war. Call him Enbelulu, the master and the bringer of wealth. They have a potent god who rules the portents of sacrifice, who guards the pastures, lakes, and springs for the land's sake, who releases springs and gives out water in plentiful supply. Second, they ought to know Enbelulu likewise as Epidon, as the master of the land and farming, bringer of furrows, who manages the canals which are in both heaven and earth, who sustains the unsullied farmlands throughout the country, who makes the trenches and canals flow, and makes furrows. Third, to praise Enbalulu as Google of irrigation of the gods, and lord of plentitude and the abundances of heaping grain, who brings about wealth, who distributes his excess to others as the provider of grains and as the cultivator of cereal crops. Fourth, that he is Enbalulu is also known by them as Hegel, as he who gathers into piles the spare supply for the people, who is the provider of plentiful rains across the wide earth and who brings about the burgeoning of all vegetative life. He is called Surser, who heaped the mountains atop Tiamat, who captured among the spoils of war 
the cadaver of Tiamat. He is ruler of the land and is likewise their good shepherd, who has given freely agriculture, garden land, and plow land, who struck out into the wide sea of Tiamat when provoked, and he was spread over the entire field of battle like a bridge. Second, that Cercer is known as Mala, and let her, Tiamat, act as his barge from henceforth, and let him be her boatman. He is called Gil, who collects great piles and masses of grains, bringing both grain and herds, supplier of the land's fertility. He is called Galima for the divine forces binding the cosmos. He brought order, the encircling band which brings goodness. He is called High Aglima, who banishes the flood and frost, made the land sit upon the waters, and formed soaring peaks. He is called Zulum, who assigned plots of land for the gods, who divvied up what he had made and bestowed temples, acting as both the giver of livelihood and the supplier of food. He is called Mumu, the maker of both heaven and earth, serving as controller of their forces, instiller of their energies, and Zulum Umu, as God, who purges heaven and earth. There are none among the divinities who equal him in might. He is called Gish Numan Ab, the one who made humanity, and who likewise established the four divisions of the earth, who ended Tiamat's divine force and made man exclusively. He is likewise known as the monarch Lugul Ab Dubur, who dispersed the offspring of Tiamat and took her weapon, he put fortitude into both the rear guard and the vanguard. He is Pagel Gwena, chief of the lords of unsurpassed power, being matchless among his kinsmen, the gods, their prince. He is Lugul Derma, the sovereign and the divine force, and is likewise the lord of the binding force of the cosmos, being second to none in the palace, indisputably supreme. He is Aranina, he is advisor, rock of his forebears the gods, who remains unsurpassed in every one of his regal manners. He is Dumu Duku, whose pristine house sits on a holy hill. Judgment would not be without Dumu Duku, Lugal Duku. He is King Lugal Shuana of unrivaled divine influence, Lord, strength of Anu, foremost as the rightful heir of Anshar. He is Aruga, who set forth to draw them from Tiamat's sway, who unifies all wisdom and holds a comprehensive insight. Call him Erkingu, since he made Kingu a prisoner of war. He pronounces rulings for all and proclaims imperatives. Call him Kinma, as ruler of all gods and source of wisdom. His uttered name makes gods shudder like an earthquake. Named E. Zizker, he has the foremost palace at the temple. The gods will arrive bringing gifts to place before his feet, for as long as he accepts the dedications they give to him. There are none who could do sorcery without his backing. No other god will determine what is due the entire people. Apart from his aid, nor the designation of their lifespans. Call him Jibal, who determines the effectiveness of arms. He who worked wonders in his confrontation with Tiamat, of deepest wisdom, and supreme in his comprehensions. So deep it is beyond the grasp of other gods to understand. His name will be Adu, and he forever spans the heavens. Let his tremendous voice be heard booming above the earth. Let him discharge the rains which fall freely from the clouds, which are the source of nourishment for humanity beneath. He is a Sharu, one true to his name, rules the gods of fate. Truly, he watches over every living person who lives on earth. Call him Nibiru, who secures the ways of heaven and earth. Neither up nor down will they pass, but only with his consent. His star is Nibiru, which is a dazzling light in the firmament. He secures the passages thus. They must seek his permission, saying, He who incessantly passed within Tiamat without stop will carry the name of Nibiru for holding fast at her center. Let he be the one who sets the stars of heaven on their way. Let him be the shepherd of the gods who will be a sheep. May he bring down Tiamat, strangle her, and end her days. So until the end of time, she remains far from our children. 
since he was the one who both made the heavens and the earth, call him Enkirker, which his forebear Elil called him. Ea heard this name, and he was so known among the Ejiji, and Ea was overcome with happiness, and spoke, saying, He who has been given such a fine name by his forebears deserves to be known by the name Ea, being my own name. He will rule over the particulars of every one of my rituals, and will administer any matter which I have proclaimed. Thus, with these fifty did the high gods give his fifty names, granting him preeminence. May they always be honored. And might the elder enlighten the younger concerning them. May men of wisdom and instruction talk among themselves, so the father might recall them and pass them on to his son. And may both the shepherd and the herdsman be amenable, that he not forget the wise counselor of the gods Marduk, so that his lands will remain productive and himself secure. He speaks words of stone and commands beyond reproach. There are none among the gods who should alter his words. Even when overcome with anger, he does not avert his gaze. But in his greatest ferocity and annoyance, the gods back off. His thinking is profound and his feelings highly developed. Both criminals and offenders are made to stand before him, and he had a scribe transcribe the unwritten commandments that had been repeated to him by the elderly amongst them. Having this set forth in writing for men to read into the future, might mankind, the people of Marduk, made by the Ejiji gods, invoke the story, utter his name, recalling the song of Marduk, of him who struck down mighty Tiamat and was made king. End of Tablet 7 and End of the Enuma Elish The Babylonian Creation Epic